a serious note, I was a sophomore at Cornell in 1962. And I went back to speak at my alma mater last year. And it caused me to reflect on how much the world had changed in the 50 years since I had been a sophomore. And also how much it had changed in the 50 years before I was a sophomore. Uh, and I think it's an important juxtaposition of half centuries that I'd like to focus on here this afternoon. A sophomore at Cornell in 1912 would have graduated in 1914, almost 100 years ago. Next year, we're going to begin a series of really horrific centenaries, centenaries, anniversaries of one of the great catastrophes of modern history, World War I. That sophomore's world turned upside down right after graduation. Happily for my class, the last 50 years have been a very different story. And that's at the heart of what I'd like to talk about today. I'd like to talk about three things. First, about the remarkable changes that have happened in the world in the last 50 years. And as I look around the room, most of you aren't old enough to challenge me on at least how it began. <laughs> but seriously, I think it is important to understand things that at best we've read about in history books and very often we haven't read about at all. Second, I want to talk about some of the challenges that those changes confront us with, and particularly the challenge of incorporating a whole new set of powerful countries into the international system. And third and finally, I'd like to explain why I think that Western leadership is still critical in this new and more complicated world, even though many non-Western countries are becoming increasingly important and powerful. I know some people think that when an American says Western, it's really a euphemism for American. We'll get into that some probably more in the question period. I really think it is actually quite important, uh, although I think American leadership is crucial to Western leadership. I think when we act as a Western alliance, uh, the effects are profoundly better. But let me begin with an assertion that may strike some of you as surprising. If you look around the world today, you might not think it's true. But the world today is more secure, more prosperous and more free than it was 50 years ago. As I say, that assertion may seem strange given the problems you can see in the world today. Let me tell you, it was worse back then. I guess that's my message, but not entirely my message. It's a more optimistic one. We see in the world today the U.S. economy still struggling from the effects of the financial collapse, and the European economy is in worse shape. The fall of dictatorships in the Arab world has the whole Middle East in turmoil, and Syria most disastrously in the third year of a bloody civil war that is spilling over into its neighbors. Further east, the future of both Iraq and Afghanistan are still in doubt, and the possibility of an Iran with nuclear weapons looms over the Persian Gulf and the entire Middle East. As if that weren't enough, North Korea, a rogue state armed with nuclear weapons, is now headed by a 29-year-old ruler who seems to feel the need to prove his manhood by shelling South Korean islands. So how can I possibly say that the world today is more secure, more prosperous, and more free than 50 years ago? Well, I think I can see maybe a few people around the room who, like me, were alive and aware on October 22, 1962 and can recall that as a time when President John Kennedy announced to the world that the Soviet Union was installing nuclear-armed missiles on the island of Cuba and demanded their removal. That was a terrifying time. For almost a week, we honestly weren't sure we'd be alive to see the next week, or whether the world as we knew it would come to an end in a nuclear holocaust. On October 28th, with the announcement that the Soviets were withdrawing their missiles from Cuba, and by the way, with the unannounced but secret agreement that the U.S. would withdraw its missiles from Turkey, that wasn't learned until many years later, that crisis came to an end. But that specter of a nuclear exchange in which the civilized world could be destroyed in a matter of hours hung over the world for the next 30 years. Today, that danger has gone away with the end of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War. It's true the U.S. and Russia still have, terribly, still have formidable nuclear arsenals that could do terrible damage. Uh, 
but the possibility of an all-out nuclear war has virtually disappeared. Terrible things could still happen with North Korea's nuclear weapons, or even those of Pakistan, particularly if Pakistan's weapons were to fall into the hands of terrorists, or if Iran gets nuclear weapons. But those threats, as frightening as they are, are still small compared to what we live with every day during the Cold War. Second, the world, although there's poverty aplenty, the world today is vastly more prosperous today than it was 50 years ago. I became the head of the U.S. State Department policy planning staff in 1981, and we were asked to take charge of the portfolio of issues that were labeled North-South relations. That term North-South and the term a North-South divide was a term that was described what at the time was thought to be a permanent division of the world between rich countries and poor countries. People had different explanations, for whether it was cultural or structural or political, but there was a kind of pessimism that the poor countries would ever actually achieve development. Today, the North-South divide has been replaced almost completely by that term emerging economies. In the last two decades, the global economy has roughly tripled from $20 trillion to $60 trillion in 20 years. And as you probably know, emerging markets have accounted for over half of that $40 trillion of growth. It's not just the numbers, it's the human stories behind that. The fact that hundreds of millions of people have escaped poverty, just 400 million in China alone, as a result of that economic progress. And it's been good for the advanced countries as well. Our consumers have benefited from access to better and cheaper products, and our producers have benefited from the expansion of global markets. So the world today is much more prosperous than it was 50 years ago. Third and finally, and perhaps most unexpectedly, the world has become much more free in the last 50 years. In 1962, there were very few democracies outside the advanced industrial countries, with the very important exception of India. In 1981, Freedom House, an American NGO that tracks the progress of freedom around the world, ranked only a third of all countries in the world as truly free. By last year, the number was slightly over half. But in many ways, what is even more remarkable, I think, than the growth in numbers is the unexpected and history-changing character of many of those changes. Changes that I honestly th thought I would never see in my lifetime. Most dramatic and most important, of course, was the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Empire. But it wasn't the only one. Another change that I thought I would never see was the end of apartheid in South Africa, which came in 1994. I guess you were just, just born around then. Amazing thing. And some of the other changes have been maybe not quite that remarkable, but pretty remarkable. My own personal experience was very heavily focused on East Asia. In the 1980s, I became Assistant Secretary of State for the US for that huge region. And in 1981, there was not a single democracy in all of East Asia with the exception of Japan. Then in 1986, a peaceful revolution took place in the Philippines and replaced the dictator Ferdinand Marcos <coughs> with a democratic government. The following year, 1987, South Korea, which hadn't had a democratic government in thousands of years of its history, threw out the dictatorship of Chun Doo Won in a peaceful transition, and it's been a robust democracy ever since, as well as one of the world's great economic success stories. Shortly after that, essentially in 1988, Taiwan, uh, the little island off of China with 20 million people, made an almost seamless transition from the dictatorship of the Kuomintang Party to a free democratic system with a dynamic free press and regular elections of the president and parliament. Arguably the first, but hopefully not the last, democratic Chinese society. In fact, as an aside, I go to Taiwan fairly often. By the way, I wasn't allowed to go when I was a government official. I can only go as a non-official. Uh, Taiwan has greatly expanded its relations with the mainland in the last few years. 
with the result there are one or two million tourists from the Chinese mainland that come to Taiwan every year. And I was amused and pleased to learn that they spend a good deal of their time sitting in their hotel rooms watching Taiwanese political talk shows because there's nothing like it on the mainland. But I assume they go back with a different idea of how Chinese can be governed, and that's a good thing. Ten years later, 1998, in Indonesia, a country where I was the American ambassador for three years, and a country that I have to confess I more or less fell in love with, but it was a dictatorship when I was the ambassador there. But in 1998, that dictator, Suharto, was forced to step down. Indonesia, the country with the largest Muslim population of any country in the world, became a democracy. Many people, pundits and experts, said it was too poor and too Muslim to succeed at democracy. But now, 15 years later, Indonesia is the world's fourth largest democracy, I'm sorry, third largest democracy, with a thriving press and civil society. It's had three free and fair presidential elections over the last 15 years and is clearly going to have another one next year. As I said, the quality of these changes is even more remarkable and I think more important than their number. I think particularly of countries like South Korea that had no prior history of democracy and where sometimes people said that the culture was antithetical to representative government. For example, there was the Confucian exception. The notion that Confucian societies are inherently authoritarian, that people in those societies like to be told what to do, that so-called Asian values are antithetical to Western democratic values. Well, South Korea is a, South Korea is a Confucian society. Taiwan is a Confucian society. There goes the Confucian exception. Taiwan, as I mentioned, is also a Chinese society, so there goes the Chinese exception. And now we are witnessing an end to the Arab exception, with the upheaval that is sweeping the Arab world. It was obviously premature to label this upheaval the Arab Spring, but I think it's equally premature to label it the Islamist winter. It will be many years before we know the true results of this upheaval. But the West has a very large stake in the outcome, and I think we need to remain engaged. If you take the example of Korea, by the way, uh, the armistice at the end of the Korean War was 60 years ago this year. For the first 10 years, it was a wretched, corrupt, failing democracy. Then it was a slightly less corrupt but brutal dictatorship. Uh, it wasn't really until 1981 that you began to see the signs of what is now a modern miracle story. Uh, so it, you need, I think we need a longer term perspective than frankly Americans usually want to take. This enormous advance of freedom in the last 30 years has been good for the tens of millions of people whose lives have been improved directly as a result. I think it's also been good for the United States and Europe. It's turned enemies into friends. It's made our friends stronger and more self-reliant. And where we have been seen to be on the side of freedom, and unfortunately that hasn't always been the case, but where we've been seen to be on that side, it's definitely improved our standing in the eyes of the people of those countries. Actually, uh, maybe I should delete it because it's I won't. Carry out in my iPad a photograph of a billboard that was erected in Tripoli shortly after the fall of Gaddafi two years ago. It says, thank you for all, I think meaning thank you for everything. It has the flags of eight countries, including the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Qatar, not Saudi Arabia, Tunisia, eight countries. But more importantly, at the center of it all is the NATO flag. If anyone had told you three years ago that there would be an Arab capital with a billboard saying, thank you, NATO, uh, I think you would have sent them to psychiatrists. But that was the result of, and we can talk about this more in the question period because I think, I think the Libyan leader who said it, we declared mission accomplished prematurely. Libya is not the success story today that I would like it to be or I think it could have been. But certainly that initial effort made by the NATO countries on behalf of the Libyan revolution was something that really changed 
opinions in that country, at least, about us. And I think opinions about us matter. They're not the, end of, they're not the beginning and the end of things, but they matter. So to come back to my original proposition, I do think the world today is more secure, more prosperous, and more free than it was when I was a sophomore. And at the risk of sounding boastful, I think it's fair to say that those achievements would not have been possible without a Western alliance that was the underpinnings of international security, without Western leadership in maintaining a relatively open, relatively open global trading system, and without Western support for democratic change, not only in the Soviet Union and the Soviet Empire, but also in countries whose leaders had sometimes been described as our sons of bitches. I don't know if you've heard this expression, but it's variously attributed to, I think it's actually President Roosevelt once talking about the dictator Somoza in Nicaragua. Well, he may be a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch. Uh, it may have been what someone said about Ferdinand Marcos, but at any rate, it was the idea that we would compromise with dictators because at least they were useful. A lot of those dictators are gone in that whole litany that I just recited. So I think it is appropriate for the West to take a bit of credit for the impressive progress the world has made in the last 50 years. And by the way, the, the people in those countries that have progressed so much are the ones who deserve the greatest credit. But I say that even though a wise man once said there's no limit to what you can accomplish as long as you don't care who gets the credit. But I think in this case, it's worth taking a little bit of credit for two reasons. First, because there's a dangerous loss of confidence developing, at least in the US, and I think also here in Europe, about our ability to contribute to global progress. And second, and even more important, I think an effective Western alliance is vital if we're going to sustain the progress of the last 50 years. Indeed, if we're going to avoid what could become a calamitous reversal of that progress. The sense that the West is in decline derives partly from the success of so many developing countries, and particularly of China. That very success has that has done so much to increase human welfare has also produced an economic challenge and a geopolitical challenge. As we look to the future, more and more countries will have the economic strength to be significant powers, at least on a regional scale, and some even on a global scale. So even at its best, the world is becoming a more complicated place. The G8, which used to get together annually to decide the future of the world economy, is now more or less transformed into the G20. But at its worst, it's not just more complicated, it's more dangerous. The possibility of conflict, I think, increases. Not only conflict, even the possibility of war, which brings me to my third and final point, why I think Western leadership is still important. Nowadays, many Americans say that my country can no longer afford to play a leadership role in the world. And I agree with that proposition in one respect. The US certainly can't afford to play that role if we don't fix our economy. But the key to doing that is making the right changes at home, not to withdraw from the world. In fact, I would maintain we can't afford to do that no matter how much natural gas we produce, no matter how comfortable we are at home. The world is still a dangerous place and one that we need to worry about. Back in 2012, there was a series of fairly wretched debates among the Republican candidates, not memorable for very much, but I remember one thing. One of the candidates was asked, what would you do if you got that call at three o'clock in the morning? I don't know why we have this image in the United States of the president gets urgent calls always at three o'clock in the morning. Sometimes they come at noon, but anyway. You get that three o'clock in the morning call and they tell you one of Pakistan's nuclear weapons has fallen into the hands of terrorists. That question's a very tough one to answer and it's not clear what we should do or, and it would clearly depend on specific circumstances that weren't contained in that question. But the very fact that that's not an implausible question demonstrates, I believe, just one of many reasons why we can't afford to withdraw from the world. In a situation like that, we can't afford not to be able to act. And indeed, we need to, if at all possible, act ahead of time so that that kind of dangerous situation doesn't come about. Obviously, 
and you're speaking to someone who's had an unfortunately long experience with our tragedies in Iraq, there's no question that two long controversial wars, which have been painful as wars inevitably are, have made Americans question our role in the world. Right now in Syria, the U.S. seems to me to be paralyzed by a fear that if we act, it will somehow lead to another Iraqi-type involvement. And that fear is certainly more than understandable. But not every situation is Iraq or Afghanistan all over again. The U.S. could make a big difference, I think, simply by more energetic support for the moderate elements of the Syrian opposition. And that doesn't mean to going, going to war on their behalf. It does mean, however, giving them financial support, medical support, including <coughs> military medical support, non-lethal military support, and yes, weapons and organization as well. I think we're in danger of repeating a different mistake in Syria, not the mistake of Iraq in 2003, but the mistake of Bosnia in the 1990s, when for three years, under two American presidents, first President George H.W. Bush and then President Clinton, the United States enforced an arms embargo on the Bosnians, who were the victims of aggression, and in the process prolonged the conflict, increased the bloodshed. Some estimates are 200,000 people died in Bosnia during those three years, and made the aftermath much worse than it might have been if the conflict had ended sooner. Indeed, Bosnia today, at least it's at peace, but it's pretty much a broken country, partitioned in all but name, better than the war, but if the war had ended much earlier, we'd have a different story. And I think that so many of the bad consequences that people feared would happen if we armed the Syrian opposition instead have happened because we didn't. Having done practically nothing while a bloody conflict has gone on there for over a year, I think the result now is going to be an even worse outcome. Even if Assad goes, and there's a real possibility now that he's going to survive and continue to rule a shattered country that will be a confirmed enemy of the United States and with some portions, potentially even a base for Al-Qaeda operations. That's just one of many dangers in the world today that I think we would be, do better to deal with and to run away from. And I'm sure in the question period you'll be after me about many others. But let me conclude by going back to my sophomore year again and with a reminder not of the 50 years that have just passed us, but the 50 years before 1962. As I mentioned, 100 years ago, the world, and particularly Europe, was confronted with the challenge of a different new emerging power, Germany. A Germany that was dissatisfied with the existing status quo, that felt that it had been denied what they called its place in the sun by the great powers of the 19th century, particularly Britain and France. Despite that, many people thought that the growth of global economic interdependence and the economic prosperity that came with it had made war a thing of the past. One such man was an American journalist named Norman Angel. He wrote a book to that effect called The Great Illusion. Couldn't get a publisher initially, so he used his own money to publish 7,000 copies. In short order, it became a runaway bestseller, selling millions of copies around the world. One of his followers, the president of another great university, Stanford, a man named David Starr Jordan, predicted following his mentor, Norman Angel, he said, and this is a quote, the great war of Europe, ever threatening, will never come. The bankers will not find the money for such a fight. The industries will not maintain it. The statesmen cannot. There will be no general war. His timing wasn't very good. He wrote that in 1913 on the eve of World War I. Sadly, that war and the other disasters that it created destroyed all the great hopes that people once had that the 20th century would be a time of great peace and prosperity. World War I, which was the worst war in human history up to that point, created the conditions of World War II, which was even worse. It created the conditions for Bolshevism in Russia, which was a human tragedy on a massive scale. 
Nazism in Germany, another massive human strategy, and Maoism in China, a third one. So instead of being a century of great promise, the next 50 years became the bloodiest half century in modern history. We cannot afford to repeat that history with the even more terrible weapons of this century. That's why I believe the alliance of the Western democracies continues to be so important for the world and particularly for ourselves. It's no exaggeration to say that the fate of future generations, that's your generation, my generation is passing from the scene. The fate of your generation and the generations afterwards depends on getting it right this time. Thank you.